Um, we will start with having Emily from CCPD give us some hiring statistics. Her presentation will take about 10 minutes and um, we should have a little bit of room at the end for questions. Um, just in case any of you do have questions that you want to run past Emily while she's here. Um, and keep in mind, there is a career fair at the end of this month, I believe. So this is a really good time to get those questions, you know, into the hands of a professional career counselor who can get you ready for that event. Um, once we do our hiring, stats uh, presentation. Karen will then take over. She'll do a brief um, introduction with our panelists and of course herself just so you get to know who everyone is that's in the room and then we get into the meet which is of course the the panel where Karen will ask our wonderful panelists questions that will help all of our students in the room understand what you can do with a civil engineering degree all the many different paths the day-to-day -day, um, to help you really get an understanding of what it means to be a civil engineer um, so for those of you who are considering it as your future major hopefully this helps a ton Ton. Um, and yes, we are recording. Um, we are going to uh, send out an email with the information from tonight, so it'll have the slides in it. Um, and then if you do realize that there's more you want to say to the alumni, um, some have already given permission to share email addresses, so we'll be sure to get those out to you too. Um, okay. Oh, and one last note before we officially start. Um, as you have questions to the evening, don't feel like you have to hold on to them, throw them into the chat. You can message me privately if that's more comfortable for you. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy and paste everything into a Word document so we can go through it right at the end um, when we do the, the formal Q&A. All right, Emily, <laughs> I'm passing the reins to you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Emily. I am the assistant director for career development here at RPI, and I'm really excited to um, be here, and I think this is such a great program. Um, so as Kristen mentioned, I'm just going to share a little bit with you um, about hiring statistics uh, for uh, civil engineering. So I apologize, I am blanking on, I want to make it full screen. Um, here we go. Hopefully that you can get a good view of this. Um, but yes, there is a career fair coming up at the end of September, so I'll give you some information about that um, after I finish. So, you know, the CCPD, we can help with a lot of things, which I will go over shortly, but one of the biggest things that we do, um, well, not one of the biggest things, but a big thing we do is really collect some hiring statistics from recent grads and alums. So every year we do a survey, um, you know, asking students, where are they working? Um, you know, what is their salary? And we use this to sort of help students sort of gauge where they could be working in the future. What's a salary they could expect? This is all anonymous. So when students share this information, um, it's just, again, it's data collecting to really help us share information. So that's a little bit of what I'm going to share with you today. So. I just wanted to give you an example of some employers that our students go to. You can get a full list of all of this on the CCPD website, right? You can get the different years. Um, and so this is just information I extracted from that. And I just highlighted, I picked four random ones to try to give a variety so that you could see a sampling of the companies that you could be you could be working with. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but you can look at um, Lang and Engineering, the Department of Transportation. I chose Massachusetts, but you know, New York was a popular Department of Transportation was a popular import, um, employer. Tie and Bond, um, Bechtel Corporation. So these are all different companies that as civil engineers you could work for. And I did give some brief information. Again, I won't go into that, you know, today, but I think Kristen does share this out. So this is just good information for you to have. And again, you can view a full list of employers on our website um, and you can even break it down by, by year. Um, I also wanted to mention to see some current opportunity opportunities listed for civil engineers. So I tried to get a good range of full-time and also internships and co-ops. So as you can see here, um, we have some companies that hire for multiple locations for internships and full-time positions. And we, you know, I chose some full-time jobs, you know, located in Long Island, New York and Connecticut. So there are opportunities being posted on Handshake for civil engineers in different capacities, right? And one important note I wanna say that 
Handshake is our primary job search. It's our career management platform here at RPI. Every college uses one. And so this is just, again, a sampling of the jobs and opportunities that are available. You can find a lot of jobs and opportunities, not only through Handshake, but through things like LinkedIn, CareerShift, which is another job search platform RPI has for its students. Um, going to company websites directly, even sites like Indeed, Glassdoor, all give you great opportunities that you could be applying to. So while we do talk about Handshake a lot, it is important to understand and know that there are so many other um, opportunities that could be posted on other platforms. But just so, you know, especially a lot of students are currently, because of the arch kind of looking for internships, there are some really good opportunities for internships in Handshake, specifically for civil engineers. So salary statistics, this is definitely something that a lot of students want to look at um, and want to know about. There's a lot of great ways to find some salary information. Um, so I, I kind of highlighted two here. This is from the class of 2019. Um, we're still working on finalizing 2020, but the average salary of those graduating with a degree in civil engineering made about $71,737. The range of those reporting was 55,000 to $110,000. Now, something to know again, this is of those reporting and this salary information um, was just broken down by major. So it's not broken down by what industry they went into, um, what size company they went into, anything like that. But this is really helpful information just to get an idea of earning potential, what students are making that are graduating with your, with you know, the degree in um, civil engineering, and we can talk to you more about other resources that you could be using for salary statistics. I also included um, information from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So for civil engineering for 2020, the median pay um, was $88,570. Again, something to note, this is sort of you can think of this as an average, but this does not know what the education or experience level is. So this is not necessarily what a new graduate is making. It could be for sure, again, depends, but this is again, a good gauge to kind of uh, gauge earning potential at some point in your career. And again, we encourage you um, to do this research on your own. You know, I, I think that all of us as career counselors here, when we have students come in, we definitely provide you some resources and give you can help give you an idea of earning potential, but we encourage students to do that research on their own, um, you know, based on their own experience, their own education level. And again, of course, what industry they're interested in working for. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of different things in the CCPD that I did want to highlight today um, beyond career exploration. You know, a lot of you might be thinking, what what do I want to get into? What do I want to declare as my major? Or if maybe you're thinking of changing your major, not only can we help you with that, we can help you create and critique your resume, um, negotiate your salary, practice some interviewing skills. Maybe you're thinking of graduate school. We can help you through that process as well. Um, you know, some other common things that students come in for, you know, creating your LinkedIn, um, preparing for the career fair, how to do an effective job search. I mean, we really do offer a lot of different services, so please do come and see us. Handshake is the best way to make an appointment, um, or you can email us um, or drop by to try to make an appointment. We are really doing all of our drop-ins virtually right now just because of COVID and um, wanting to track who, you know, keep as less uh, people in the office at once as possible. So we do drop-ins virtually this semester, um, but for appointments, we can see you in person or virtual. It's whatever you're comfortable with. Um, before I get into any questions, I did want to say that the career fair, the Nesby Shep Fall Career Fair is September 23rd and 24th from um, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's virtual this year through a platform called Career Fair Plus. Um, I believe there's over 100 employers attending already. Um, so it's going to be a really, really great event and I hope you all can make it. We do have some career fair prep workshops coming up. 
on not only how to register and use the platform, but just how you can prepare for a virtual career fair. All of that information is in Handshake, so I do encourage you to look through that. Um, but that ends my formal presentation, so I'm happy to take any questions um, at this time. Yes, and we certainly, you can always throw it in the chat and we welcome you at this moment if you want to unmute your mic and even ask a question, um, if you if you have one to ask. <clears throat> so, we talked about this a bit last week, but Emily, um, we know a lot of first year students aren't really sure if they should be going to the very first career fair of their time at RPI, you know, the one this fall. I would love if you could share your perspective on that. Um, and, you know, if anyone wants to throw a question in the chat while Emily is letting us start know what she thinks about it. Sure, definitely. So I would absolutely encourage first year students to attend the career fair um, for a couple of different reasons. Um, you know, one, it's just really good practice to start networking, developing your elevator pitch, and just getting more comfortable being in front of employers. Because as you go through your time at RPI, as you begin your internship search or your full time job search, being able to be comfortable, you know, making those connections, having those conversations is really going to be helpful. And so the earlier you start, the more practice you have, right? The next reason is to, I think I mentioned, but to not only learn how to network and build those connections, but to get those connections, right? Networking is so important to the job search. I always say, you never know who other people know, what they know, and what they're willing to share with you, and how that might help you in your career, even if it's not right now, down the road. You know, you can start thinking, what do I want to do for my arch away semester? What are some companies that offer civil engineering internships in the spring? Or is it, or do they offer them in the fall? Right? So you can really learn and make those connections. The next, again, if you're exploring different career options, a career fair is a really great way to learn about those job opportunities because as much as you're learning, you want to, um, tell the employer about yourself and why you would be a good fit for their company just as much they want to share why you should work with them so why that company what do they do um what are the jobs that they're recruiting that again will help you get more information what is it like to be a civil engineer at this company um what are the job requirements what are the daily responsibilities so it, it's a good way to sort of information gather along with you know that networking connections and sort of practicing so i don't think it's ever too early the other thing is especially now because it is virtual um I don't know if anyone here has been to an in-person career fair yet, especially at RPI. It can be really overwhelming. There's a lot of companies to talk to. There's a lot of other students who are looking to talk to companies. And in this virtual environment, one really positive of it is it allows you that individual one-on-one -on -one time with recruiters without all of that background noise. So it's a really good introduction to that practice without having all of that sort of um, distraction in the background. So I definitely encourage all first year students to go, whether you're searching for opportunities or not, it's just such a good experience to, to get to know um, what it's like to attend a career fair. Thank you so much, Emily. And actually, I do have a question for you too that I got privately. Sure. Um, they are wondering, uh, is the process of applying for jobs any different for international students, which is a great question. Good question. Um, the biggest, the biggest difference I'll say, and I, I is. You want to make sure that that company you're applying for um, sponsors international students. So accepts OPT or CPT basically um, in handshake. That's actually something that Handshake does a really good job of, and you can filter by, you know, companies who will hire students with OPT and CPT. Um, so you really, when you're searching, you can filter out by that option. And then, um, or the other terminology a lot of companies use is accepts work authorization, right? So that's what you want to be looking for in a job description. 
the other thing um, this year for the career fair, I'll say as an example, we actually have a, or this Nesby and Shep, those student organizations set up a really great filtering option. Um, so you can actually filter by the companies who are, um, you know, authorizing sponsorship through OPT or CPT. So it's not that the process is necessarily different in the search. You just want to make sure you're finding those companies that will support students with OPT or CPT. Thank you so much. Sorry, I couldn't click on the mute button for some <laughs> reason. <laughs> uh, I got a thank you from our students. So that, that definitely answered the question. Um, Thank you so much, Emily, for taking the time to talk with us today. As always, super helpful and great information. Um, and, you know, I, I'll make sure everyone gets uh, Emily's contact information that you get the slides. Uh, so that way you can continue the conversation, um, you know, especially with that quote unquote looming career fair that I hope you do all take the time to, to visit, uh, which it's really easy to say that now because it's online. So you can literally just get into a dorm with a group of your friends, log on together and figure out what this is all about completely together and not not alone, which I kind of, I love that for your first ever career fair. Um, awesome, thank you, Emily. Um, and now I'm gonna pass the reins over to Karen. Karen, if you wanna take the lead on the next portion. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Karen Lewis, and I am the first year advisor for civil and environmental engineers in the School of Engineering Advising Hub. Uh, thanks for coming. And I'm going to have my contact information at the end in case anybody who is not declared in civil chooses to uh, look more into the major. I'm happy to answer questions either on the chat or off the chat. Um, if my panelists can turn on their cameras, I'm going to have them introduce themselves to you. And uh, we're just going to start from there. Um, Rich, since you turned your camera on first, would you mind kicking off an introduction and telling us a little bit about yourself, like where you work, obviously your name, um, where you're from and where you're living currently, and the degree that you got in college and where you went? I know it's a lot. <laughs> I can. Well, that's fine, Karen. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Rich Toker. I'm a civil engineer. I graduated from RPI with a civil engineering degree a lot of years ago. I think it would be about 43 years ago. And immediately after graduation, I went on to get a master's degree in geotechnical engineering at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And I spent my career um, as a consulting engineer, I'm still consulting in Denver. And I, with, uh, with COVID and the ability to work remotely, even before COVID, uh, my wife and I moved to a ski town called Crested Butte, Colorado, which is about 20 miles south of Aspen. A lot of people know where Aspen is, but we're over the mountain range from Aspen. So I work remotely from Crested Butte and meet with my staff. Uh, that are on the front range in the Denver Fort Collins area once a month or once every other month on projects. I, I grew up in northern New Jersey, uh, but I've always had an affinity for northern New York. Uh, my father actually went to RPI, and we've always had a farm in the Adirondack Mountains. Um, so I've, I've spent my whole career essentially in upstate New York, my whole life, not just my career, my whole life. Uh, during my career, um, I did a lot of different things, but always working for consulting engineering firms where we would consult and design projects either for a government agency, like a local state entity, like, for example, uh, Emily talked about the uh, Massachusetts Department of Transportation. I've done a lot of transportation work. Um, we had a big building boom in Denver in the 1980s and even in the 90s, and I designed a lot of high rise foundations, which require deep foundations into the underlying bedrock. And for the last 20 years of my career, I've been designing dams, reservoirs, and levees, which I actually find is the most interesting part of geotechnical engineering, because you get involved in, in not just the, the soil structure interaction, but you get involved working with structural engineers and working with water resource engineers. So that, that's been 
the, the best part of my career, I would have to say. I think that's it, Karen. You take it from here. Thank you, Rich, Thank and you. thanks for joining us. Uh, Ruben, would you like to follow up with that question as well, giving us some insight on where you work, where you're from and live, and the degree that you got in school? Certainly. Uh, again, my name is Ruben Hull. I'm a civil regional manager for Labella Associates. Um, I keep wanting to say Albany. We just moved to Latham into a, a new office in Latham. Uh, but here in the Capital District, I live in Schenectady. Uh, I've been here now for 14 years. I moved here from New Hampshire um, 14 years ago. I was in New Hampshire for um, for 20 years. Um, I'm originally from uh, about two hours south of Albany. Uh, grew up in the Ulster in the Catskills in Ulster County in a town called Ellenville. Um, went to RPI freshman year, and then um, due to personal um, personal matters. Um, Took a year off, uh, went went back. Um, I did go back and forth um, to RPI over the course of a few years, and then ended up transferring to the University of New Hampshire. Uh, I got a job in New Hampshire, and while I was there, uh, finished completed my civil engineering degree. So my goal was to finish my degree um, before my tenth year high school reunion, and I just made it by uh, about three months. Um, okay, so my I've been a civil engineer. I was in the civil program at RPI um, transferred to the civil program at, at the University of New Hampshire, and I've been um, likewise in the consulting industry ever since, uh, either for consulting firms or uh, for five years where I ran my own uh, consultancy out of my living room. I love that. Thank you. And our third panelist is Cassie. Um, same questions and take it away, Cassie. <laughs> All right, I am Cassie Cromish. I graduated RPI in 2020. I got my bachelor's degree in May and I graduated in 2020 December with my master's. Um, so I actually got a tiny bit of the COVID experience, a little bit of online schooling for my master's as well as the very end of my senior year. Um, I work now as a consulting. I work for Langen Engineering in Philadelphia, um, and I'm in South Jersey where I grew up. Um, and yeah, I have worked in, I worked um, for Langen as a site civil and a geotech for my um, internships two years. And then I also worked as an internship for the New York City um, state D DEC, which is the Department of Environmental Conservation one summer, um, but now I am a full time geotech staff. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I think that we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, the biggest question that a lot of these students have, since many of them are currently undeclared engineers, is why would I want to be a civil engineer? So. If you guys can answer, and if you're okay with the order, we'll just continue in that same sequence of what made you decide that you wanted to be a civil engineer? Because it is a big question when you're 18 years old. I'm going to start with. Okay, Rich. I guess I I'll go first. Um, and I wasn't 18 when I decided to be an engineer. I think I was more like 12 years old. I kind of always knew, even in elementary school, that I wanted to be an engineer. And I wasn't quite sure what. Uh, my dad is, was a civil engineer, a chemical engineer, and I've known RPI um, since I was about six or seven years old. So I um, I applied to RPI and several other schools, but RPI was really where I really wanted to go to because I had kind of grown up knowing about the program there and what civil engineers do. And I started the program and I wasn't really sure uh, what branch of civil engineering I wanted to do. At first I thought, you know, being a structural engineer would be really interesting, designing bridges and tall structures and ski lifts. And then I, I saw, um, when I, I did a couple of career fairs and I went, my, my dad took me to some offices and, you know, there were room, back then there were just rooms of engineers sitting at big desks. And I was like, you know, I would really like to be outside part of the job and kind of the beauty of being a geotechnical engineer is you need to get out to the site and understand 
what how the ground is going to behave by either being sitting on a drill rig and drilling test holes and collecting samples and just seeing what the soil and rock look like as it comes out of the ground. So that gave me the opportunity to be outside. And the other part was that, you know, I wanted to see what construction was like. And the first part of any typical, whether it's horizontal or vertical construction, any part of site development starts with the geotechnical aspects of the site. So you're at the site right at the beginning, seeing how when you open up the ground, if it, it compares to what you designed. So I really liked that as, as a career and it, it served me well. And, and that's what I did for, I've done for 40 years. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. And Ruben, you wanna answer the same question as to the big why? <laughs> Yeah, um, and I took a little bit of a different route. Um, I knew when I was in high school, I knew very much that I wanted to be an architect. And the year after my junior year in high school, I did a tour of a couple of different schools in New York, uh, SUNY Buff or Buffalo, Syracuse, and RPI, and met with the architectural departments at each one of them. And each one of them told me, you should think about engineering. Um, I, I did not have the art background or the portfolio that architectural schools were looking for. I didn't know what civil engineering was. Um, I didn't know really what engineering was. But I went back home, went to the library that next week, did some research, found civil engineering, um, found structural as part of that. And it was, it was something that I felt could, from an engineering math and science background, could get me into the world of architecture and the world of of buildings and building design. And uh, the irony is that much of what I've done, having been in the civil um, discipline for my career, is um, usually I'm you know five feet outside the building and beyond. You know, um, I have done work where I've, I've done building work, I've managed building teams, but for the most part, it's it's big infrastructure and uh, you know big projects that uh, that we're working on. But yeah, that, that was my path. And the architectural department at RPI is one of the inspirations as to how I became an engineer. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And and Cassie, did you have a similar experience or? Um, a little different. I actually came into RPI as an environmental engineer. I really, um, I didn't know, I mean, I knew a little bit about civil engineering, but I really thought environmental um i grew up my mom had done some environmental engineering she was a mechanical and i always loved her stories of going to site visits and traveling a little bit and doing her design so i was like i'll do environmental and i i really enjoyed those um stories and wanted to do something like that when i got to rpi i didn't really environmental didn't really fit with me um and i was actually choosing between civil and architecture as well but i also did not have that architecture portfolio um i am pretty artistic i love doing artistic things but i i always thought i would go into more of an engineering science so i went with civil engineering and then once i was in civil engineering i found geotechnical engineering, which was, that was the bridge between my love for the environmental, what I thought, uh, like what I thought environmental was, was what geotech was for me. So I wanted something with hands-on experience. I wanted something with design. Um, and then I also wanted something that was very personable where you're dealing with um, consultants and clients. So. Um, and I also like dirt a lot, which was quite funny because geotechnical, you know, soil is our engineering, um, what we designed. So that's, it fit right in with me. That's awesome too. Thank you. Now, this question is for Rich and Ruben. Um, both of you have, as you mentioned, quite an extensive work history. Um, can you give us another overview of your job experiences, perhaps the highlights of some of them that you found particularly gratifying? Uh, anything you want to share? If Rich, you want to begin again, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, when I finished my master's degree, I, I went and interviewed with a number of different companies, uh, 
in trying to decide if I wanted to work for a, a large consulting firm or a small consulting firm. And I was really, I think the biggest interest I had is what kind of training I was going to get the first few years at a company. And I, I settled on a company uh, by the name of Chen and Associates, and it had about, oh, about 50 people or so. And it was kind of considered the premier geotech consulting firm in Denver at the time. And they immediately sent me out on construction sites to test soil, to test the density of fill being placed. And that's not really something that you learn about in school. And so I went out with seasoned field engineers and they said, here, here's a nuclear density meter, start taking density of the soil and measuring the moisture content. And I said, okay, I can do that. And you'll report it back to the contractor and tell the owner's rep what you're getting. And so I did that for six months and that was, that was interesting. And then they said, okay, your next training is you're going to go out on a drill rig and collect soil samples and bedrock samples and bring them back to the laboratory. And I said, oh, that sounds great. I don't mind. You know, and, and that was, that was October. So November, it started snowing and we kept going out on the drill rig. And it was, it was all very interesting and, and you, you weren't at home ever, you know, you're traveling, which is fine. I was single. I'd go out and spend a few nights in a motel and the drillers would be there and we'd get up in the morning and we'd go out and figure out where the site was and how we, what we should sample. And that would it'd be long days and it was great. And then the uh, kind of the highlight of that experience was my boss said, hey, you did great on that. You know, now we have this project on Interstate 70 in Glenwood Canyon, which has kind of been making national news. We need you to organize the drill rigs and go out into Glenwood Canyon and drill for the tunnels that are gonna be built for the interstate. I said, that sounds great. So I spent all of the next winter in Glenwood Canyon where the sun doesn't shine, working with drillers and a crew of geologists drilling all the exploratory borings for two different tunnels in the canyon and see that and the that project that was in the late um 1970s and finally the project was finished and built in 1993 and this past summer it's made you know national news because of mudslides that have come down and closed the highway nine different times and so then we we built that company up and the original owners wanted to um cash out, if you will, and retire. So we ended up selling the company and it was purchased several different times. And I, I went on to a, another bigger, I decided I want to go work for a bigger company. So I went to a company by the name of Woodward Clyde Consultants, which does not exist anymore. That's, that subsequently was purchased. And then, and there's been this, this last 20 years, a large consolidation in the consulting engineering business. And that firm was bought out uh, by a publicly traded engineering firm, which was subsequently bought by a company called AECOM, which is now the largest engineering company in the country with over 40,000 employees. And I worked there for a while and I said, oh, I'll, I'll try another publicly traded company. I worked for a publicly traded company called Tetratech for 10 years. And, and that's all very interesting, but you know, at the end of the month, the question is, you know, did you make your, your sales goals? Not how good were your engineering decisions? And so I kind of in the 10 years of that was enough. And now I'm working for a, a small 40, 45 person engineering firm where the goal is to make good engineering decisions and work with clients and design very good projects. So I guess that's my highlights. Thank you. Um, yeah, following following on that. Um, so I've been, as I said, in the consulting arena. Um, I the first job I had was I was doing wastewater treatment plant design, and then going and doing construction inspection of the work that I had had designed. It was a small engineering firm in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, um, and I I was there for about nine years, primarily doing again, as I said, it was wastewater treatment projects. But what I realized while I was there is, and this is something that stuck with me my whole career, is I was never 
the technical guru, the technical wizard. I was the 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 jack of all trades. I was working on mechanical project or components. I was working on the 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 environmental um, aspects of the the wastewater treatment. I was also working with the architects, and I was working on parking lot design. And I would so I was coordinating with the geotechnical. Of the three of us, I'm the one who. I guess you know I'm the odd one out here because to me geotechnical is voodoo. So I just trust whatever you two will uh, will give me. Um, but that's part of what I did is I was doing. At the time, I didn't realize it, but I was doing project management in a civil engineering world. And at the time, I didn't know that was actually a, a thing, a skill, a profession. Um, but that's part of what my skills are: is working with people working with teams, whether those are the teams of engineers, the team, um, the stakeholders in the project, the owners, the clients. Um, after being there for about nine years, I had an opportunity from another company to go, and it was a completely different direction, doing private development, land development design, parking lots and um, parking lots and stormwater is essentially what it was. I was working, we, we did schools. Um, I did, I was working for McDonald's and Burger King at the same time, working on two different uh, projects simultaneously for one for each. Um, did multifamily housing, did affordable housing, did luxury condominiums um, across the board, but that was a completely different beast where a lot of that design is designed toward um, getting permits and getting the project approved. And then it goes to a contractor for for construction. Um, some turnover at that company. Uh, I ended up at that point. It was a prime time to go out and satisfy one of my career goal, which was to open my own business. And I did. I, I did that for about five years, um, working probably fifty fifty on um, municipal projects. I had municipal clients and I had private clients. And likewise, I was working on. Commercial developments, retail developments, uh, residential subdivisions, but I was also working on streetscape improvements, um, municipal project, water and sewer projects, a couple of bridge projects. Um, do again because of personal reasons, I came back to New York. Um, have worked for a couple of firms here, uh, consulting firms, and then I went up and worked at Global Foundries uh, for four years doing design services on part of a construction team. Got to be on the other side of the table. I was working for the construction company, uh, but I was working on the, the design arm of that where we were essentially doing all the um, that project turned it's so fast and furious that that project was was being built off of 60% design plans and my team was responsible to take the other 40% to get it to completion as it was being built and that that was a very different world to to be in uh, to be on that side of it um and then uh, about a year and a half ago I got an opportunity with Labella Associates to come and grow a civil engineering team here in Albany for a company that has a historically is a civil engineering firm, but did not have a presence, um, big geographical void. I was hired to to do that and um, accepted that and, and created my own team, creating my own business, uh, somewhat of a entrepreneur, but within the realm of another company. So I don't have to do the, the accounting and the, the human resources. You know, I've got the support now from a technical side. It's very much like my own consultancy that I had with my team that I now have, um, but I have the backing of a, you know, a 1200 person firm. That's great. Thank you. And basically what I, what I'm reading from here is that there's endless possibilities with a civil engineering degree, because you've done such different things and with management and everything else. I, I, I really enjoyed listening to both of you. So thank you. Now, Cassie, you and I talked a little bit before this, and one of the things that you touched on was, um, you know, you're relatively new to the workforce, but one thing that you did like and enjoyed about um, being a civil engineer currently was your travel experiences. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, and also going off theirs, you can also, a great thing about civil engineering is civil engineers are needed everywhere. There's infrastructure going up everywhere. And also, I mean, not all of us are in consulting, but um, civil engineering is a large part of government and there's government in each state. So huge plus to en civil engineering. Um, but yeah, I actually, traveling is something I wanted to do. It's, um, and I have got the experience from my company in the last eight months to do it. So um, geographically here in Philadelphia, I go to sites um, in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, but I also have helped out offices in New York. And then there was also a big project in Utah that I was able to go to for about a month. Um, I've gone to small sites, large sites, all different types of sites you wanna go to. Um, I've done farmland, I've done waterfront, city. Um, I love doing all of these different things. Um, civil engineering, you're always learning something new and every single site comes with its own challenges and it comes with its own learning experiences. But for traveling, um, going specifically to Utah into like a very large site, um, the site size is about the size of Salt Lake City, if that gives any indication about how large the site was. So that was crazy. I was able to see soil that I've never seen before on the East Coast and see how it works. And then also on such large construction sites, you get to see and have experiences with different construction that you're not going to see on normal small sites. So I got to see tons of different things and yeah, it was great. <laughs> But I also had possibilities to go travel to California, do sites in Arizona for borings and um, construction. So, but I didn't get to go to those because I also have things to do here and there's always the option to go or not. <laughs> yeah. Very cool, thank you. Now, um, here at RPI, and this is information for our, our undeclared engineers too, uh, within the civil engineering curriculum, you're required to choose a concentration. And um, I suppose you can guess what two of our panelists um, might have been during uh, undergrad, but you, you have the option between transportation engineering, structural engineering, geotechnical en uh, engineering. And our newest concentration, which is being implemented and rolled out this spring, is our water resource engineering. And we also have environmental engineering concentrations within the civil engineering degree. Now, um, how would you guys classify the type of work you do as a CE? And is there any overlap between those concentrations? Well, you've kind of heard that I'm as practiced as a geotechnical engineer, but the last 20 years, about half of the work has been water resource related, planning for, for reservoirs, doing stream restoration, and it has a, a big geotechnical component, but it also is starts with the water resources with the hydraulics and hydrology of the of a, a river basin. And of course, as part of geotech, I do a lot of work interfacing with structural engineers also. Yeah, my background again is very has been very diverse, and I found myself on projects that I have to go back to my my textbooks for, for things that I haven't done in in years. Um, I have done just a sampling of some of the projects that I've worked on um, have ranged from I've done steel you know two three story structural design of steel frame buildings. Um, I have done a dam breach analysis for. Uh, a couple of dams. I have done bike and pedestrian bike paths, uh, converting a railroad to a bike trail, which includes both the bike part itself as well as bridges and culverts. Um, I have uh, right now. I'm doing a lot of solar sites, uh, solar installations, which are um, you know, again I'm, with that a lot of coordination with the uh, structural, the geotech, the environmental as well as the electrical engineering uh, that that goes into citing those sites and then getting them approved um I, I probably if i had 
remained at RPI and had to make a choice, I probably would have gone the environmental route. But once I got out in the, the real world, um, what we've learned is that the the opportunities are limitless and they are endless. And I, I go back to my experience at, um, at Global Foundries. When I was at RPI, I took, um, I can't remember which course it was, I think it was one of the materials courses, and they talked about semiconductors. And I sat in that class, like, I'm never going to need to know this. And I just, you know, I, I got through it. And 25 years later, I wish I was paying some attention because I was working in a semiconductor facility. So it, it all, it, it comes around. And um, I am also a geotechnical. I feel like we should talk about uh, traffic and environmental here, even though none of us, I mean. We all have probably dabbled in it a bit, um, working with them and such. Um, my experience, I actually, I, I worked as half of, I mean, my career is small right now, but I've worked as a site civil, which we don't have as a discipline, but which not many colleges have that. Um, it's kind of has hydrology involved with it a lot and they kind of plan out sites. So that has a lot of, to me, I really like site civil because of the aspect of, it was a little bit artistic where you, you're designing a site from scratch and putting it on CAD and on paper. But I, I love geotechnical too much to not do it. Um, but I have worked with traffic and the site civil who works with architects and site civil, they work with others as well but yeah and then environmental as well we work with environmental sometimes side by side on sites when we're collecting soil they're collecting um soil for different testing they're testing for you know the vocs and different chemicals while we're testing for the strength of the soil so yeah if i could again just follow up on that real quickly on the transportation side of it with the infrastructure bill that is you know, in, in the pipeline and in progress and what's expected, the entire transportation industry and whether that's highways, bridges, um, that, that's all going to be a big piece of, of where, where as civil engineers, we are going to have a lot to say in how that gets, uh, that gets implemented. And as Cassie had mentioned, there's a lot of job opportunities with departments of transportation and whether it's at the state level, the federal level, or even at the local level for um, at, at county highway departments and you know, municipal city department, city engineering. And that that's going to be a civil engineers are going to have a very integral role in the policy that happens in the next 15 years to implement this in infrastructure, which is sorely needed that's absolutely agreed i i've been having conversations with everyone about the market and the need for engineers um namely civil and environmental has just been you know the demand is very high so um as far as securing a, a job after graduation i don't think any of the students have much to worry about at this point um ruben uh you mentioned um you are a civil regional man or, uh, manager, and I was just curious about the qualifications that you would say would be required to uh, obtain that kind of a position. Uh, again, my as my career has evolved, it's something that I became aware of that I had, you know, I had skills that were naturally working on working with projects, working with teams, um, and. Kind of fell fell into that role, um, and the opportunities were brought to me where there was a team of young engineers. I'm mentoring is a big part of what I do. You know, and a lot of it is the passion that I have of, um, like I said, more than just the technical role. It's it's putting a project together. It's the love of of putting a project together, of creating and building and leading a team. Uh, some of the things that can be done to to prepare for that or to to acquire those skills um, right now it's you know when one is in college working on projects um, ultimately at RPI the capstone project you know th those kind of 
opportunities to learn and hone leadership skills and to learn and hone, hone um, team building and teamwork um, and stakeholder management, understanding and reading, reading the public, reading your client. Uh, you have to have those people skills to then be able to to manage a team and whether it's again, whether it's managing a team, whether it's managing an office, whether it's managing a project, all of those soft skills are all things that can be developed. Um, I don't believe there's a course that teaches that, but there's opportunity in every course to, uh, to do that and, and to, to pay attention to it, to pay attention to what you're doing to complete a project, whether it's on your own or with a, 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 a group, a project group. Um, and let me let me put this one out there is, um, you know, as as hopefully we get back to a sense of normalcy. If anybody um, that's that's on this call is um, involved in fraternity or sorority, you know, doing having leadership roles in in those or in activities uh, on on sports teams. I had hired somebody. Um, out of RPI who was on the football team um, again, not the most technical across the boards, but a wonderful engineer um, because he knows how to put a project together and he knows to ask the right questions. And so again, skills that he got on the football field, just as important as the skills that he got in the civil engineering classes. You just set me up for my next question quite perfectly. So thank you. Um, I wanted to talk about undergrad and uh, what what your experiences looks like? Did you do internships and join professional groups, sports, undergrad research? Can you tell me a little about a little bit about what your experiences were? And we could start with you, Rich. Okay. So um, as an undergraduate, I did not do internships, but what I did is in the spring I would go home to my parents' ha house in northern New Jersey, and I would go around and and talk to potential hire companies to hire on for a summer job. I did one summer as on a survey crew, which I, was very um, interesting because I was out there. You know, we were cutting through the brush and and shooting a property line, and it was that was that was very uh, enlightening. You know, you bring your lunch and you're out in the field all day long. And then I did. Um, a couple of summers working for the county park commission in their engineering department and they would say okay you know we need a parking lot built and you're the project manager i'm like well i've never built a parking lot well you're, you're going to get out there and hear the specs and go ahead and get started and we'll oversee you so i i did two summers working for the county park commission which was great then uh, the last summer um, after my senior year um, I basically um, took off and headed to Colorado and went climbing for the summer, which was before I started grad school. But while I was an undergraduate during during the school year, the, the main activity that I, I did a couple, but the main thing I did is I participated in the outdoor club, the outing club. And I, I worked, I went on trips with a lot of upperclassmen who taught me um, essential outdoor skills, rock climbing skills, mountaineering skills, ice climbing skills. And I think what I really learned from that was you, you don't just give up, you know, it's not a nine to five kind of thing. You know, you, you persevere through till the end of the, the climb or the end of the mountain, and then you get back down safely. And a lot of those people that I, I did that with as an undergraduate, I still climb and hike with 40 years later. Um, I also played intramural hockey which I, I kind of had, you know, that that was when I didn't mind going out on a hockey rink at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night uh, playing hockey. You know, now I, I still skate, but I'm done by 8 o'clock at night. And I was, um, let's see, I was also in the um, ASCE student chapter. I was actually president my senior year. And that was, that was a, a good leadership test, motivating my fellow classmates for, participating in the student chapter. So that's kind of my my experiences during college. Um, I like what my ASCE 
uh, I'm very active in ASCE now, and it started at the RPI student chapter. Um, I wasn't overly active. I didn't participate in Steel Bridge or Concrete Canoe or any of those, but I was a member. We'd go to the meetings and uh, just enjoyed having speakers come in and tell us about, you know, projects or um, work day. Um, as I alluded to, I mentioned fraternities and sororities. I was in a fraternity. Um, I was the rush chairman, vice president, um, and president uh, while I was there. And again, I think that really helped to get home some of the leadership skills that I that I have, which transferred to my to my day job. Um, I was also um, a member of RPI Players, and there was actually a time where I had contemplated leaving engineering and going into theater. Um, and then I got smart and realized I can be an engineer and do theater on the side. I can't be an actor and do engineering on the side. So I, I stayed with engineering, but I've still been involved. Um, and I was also minoring in theater when I was at RPI. And I think a lot of the, the theater experience is also with me in terms of public presentations and a lot of the work that I do involves being public facing or working with, you know, meeting with the mayor or meeting with um, DOT region lead. And so there's a lot of that part of the, the, the theater side of it that, again, is completely, you know, it's not technical at all, but I think that sets me apart from many of my competitors in that that's a skill that I have um, Partly because of those activities that I had while I was while I was there, an interest that was not technical uh, that can still carries itself um, with value today. And I, I did um, intramural floor hockey. My uh, my bony ankles would not let me skate, so I just did I did floor hockey. Um, my time, I um, I was on the RPI cross country team and the track and field team winter and spring. Um, that was a huge part of my college experience. Um, our our cross country and track team, they're amazing. Like we were nationally, we go to nationals every year, and it's a huge um, it's a huge it's a really great community, and it was a really great just time and friends at RPI. For civil, I was, I'd go to some ASC meetings. I didn't have much time. Um, I also got my master's degree while getting my bachelor's degree. So I'd also, I'd be going to class, practice, class again at night. So when I could get to some meetings, I would. Um, I also, my senior year, I did GeoWall, me and a few of our geotech friends started the club up again. It hadn't been there for a few years, so we were all brand new to it. And that was an amazing experience. I learned so much just from that club. Like it was pretty much a like class, I guess, but it was just fun us messing around in the basement of the JEC with, um, you know, boxes of soil and stuff. So we, uh, and so GeoWall that we have a concrete canoe and steel bridge, which may, might be, um, you can tell what they are by their name, but GeoWall is you're making a um, a wall held up by paper, pretty much. And in geotechnical, it's a retain like a retaining wall, MSC wall. So your paper and the weight of the sand is what's holding it up. There's no like it's just paper and sand holding up this wall. So um, that's all you need to know, I guess. <laughs> Um, we actually, so we went to Minnesota and we, we actually won. We went all the teams nationally and it was an amazing experience. So that was great. Um, and I also met my best friends through that. So I also did some research sophomore year and with environmental engineering professor. So I got a little bit of, um, research experience. Um, also, so, and that was a great time. Um, and then I did my internships that I discussed before. Awesome. And Karen, we ought to note, you know, we kept talking about ASCE. ASCE is the American Society of Civil Engineers. 
<laughs> which is the professional organization that we all kind of belong to and meet our coworker, our, our peer group. Thank you for clarifying that. I actually was going to chime in with similar because since since they're undeclared, they, they might not be familiar with it, but we do have a chapter here at RPI. And um, the other thing too, I mean, basically what we're taking away from all of this is uh, you're not just an engineer as a student, you are a human being that has interests and can can apply those to later in life is what we're learning. So diversify your experiences um, as an undergrad because I think it would only benefit you in the future. Um, we're actually getting a little short on time, so I'm gonna start um, just maybe with two more questions. Um, the first one is basically um, the big question because so many students have concerns about how far they should go in their education. And as a civil engineer, I wanted to know what your, your thoughts are as far as um, extending beyond bachelor's. Do you recommend a master's degree or a PhD or a professional licensing? Um, anything that you, know, you wanna weigh in on that? Because students always ask and you know, I think that it's recommended, but I, I want to hear it from those who have achieved. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll start off on that. Um, for geotechnical engineering, I think you absolutely need a master's degree. And you, you need it not only for the technical aspects, but also to advance in an organization, whether it's a consulting firm, a government agency, or some industry. Uh, there are certainly plenty of opportunities with a bachelor's degree. And as um, Ruben was pointing out, with the infrastructure bill passing, there are going to be an unbelievable amount of demand for civil engineers with bachelor's degrees. And certainly, if you're a consulting engineer, you need to be uh, registered with a professional uh, license. And when I was at RPI, it actually was required that you take your EI before you graduate. I don't know, I don't, you, Karen, maybe you can fill us in on that one at this point. I can fill, fill um, so the FB, uh, I'd say pretty much every civil, I don't know if, ever, I'd say every civil engineer takes the FB after college and that gets you an EIT, which is an engineering training. And then once different states all have different regulations, but so like, for example, in Pennsylvania, once um that you get the eit you have four years of experience and then you can take the professional engineer and then not everyone gets the professional engineer pe but it is a good goal um that a lot of engineers have a civil as in right now because i just took the fb and you know starting that process thank you i i get to offer my opinion on it i think a lot of it has to do with what one wants to do in their career. I think if somebody is intending to be um, to, to be very technical, to do design, to be you know innovative, there's going to be a lot of innovation and need for innovation in the civil world. Um, I, I think a master's is you know would would be necessary, uh, particularly if one is going to become a, a lead in in their profession. Um, I have not needed it because again, I've taken a different, you know, a different path to, to where I am, but I'm also, like I said, I'm not the technical guru on my projects. I've got people who are, and for those, when I'm hiring somebody, if I'm looking for someone that, you know, if somebody has a master's, they're bringing a different level of, uh, of a game for, um, for me to consider. Um, with the PE, I would absolutely, I don't see any reason why a civil engineer should not be getting a professional license in their, in, in their, their career. There's very few, a lot of other, um, engineering disciplines don't require, particularly if somebody's working in industry, but in the civil engineering world, uh, it, it really is a, a requirement once you're, you know, for, for most, I believe most firms are, it's an expectation. Uh, and to get that, you need to take, you know, get your EIT. And uh, the one thing is that if you do your master's, that times, that time actually counts toward part of your experience as, as postgraduate experience. So getting the master's also can offset the need of um, some of the experience that you need to get the PE. 
And um, there's also a whole side of academia that we're not hitting on where if you want to be a specialized and there's a ton of work out there that is research based and it also pulls into the government because the government uses research from um, different academia into laws that we use as consultants. It's a whole big cycle, you know? So if you do want to specialize in something that you're really passionate about in civil engineering or you want to stay in academia, that's a something you can do. Great, thank you. Uh, so I think we're um, going to start wrapping things up, but I wanted to ask you all, um, you've been such a wealth of information and your experiences have been just amazing to listen to, um, for me at least. And I think uh, any advice that you can offer um, students, you know, um, I'm gonna combine two actually, because my question would be like, if you knew something now that you, that you wish you knew when you were a freshman, and also any other additional advice, like reflect on on what you've accumulated through your years of experience as a student and, and a professional. Just give us some closing words of what you recommend to, to our students who are deciding um, on their path today. Okay, I've got, I've got two things to, to add here. The first is uh, during my undergraduate career, I kind of always sat in the back and didn't really, you know, I didn't need to participate. And I think that my takeaway would be, I would have challenged my professors a lot more had I known that I was gonna go into this. Yeah, I, my professors were great, but you know, I, when the bell rang, I'd walk out and that was that, and I'd turn in my assignments. Um, and then my advice, which I give to all of my young engineers is check and double check your work before you submit it for review. I will, um, I guess my advice, and this is kind of twofold, is um, don't get comfortable with where you think your career is going to go because things are going to change. Don't feel hemmed in by decisions that you're making at the age of 18. Um, I don't trust the decisions of any 18 year old, myself included, when I was 18. And the world's going to change. Things are going to change around you. Um, there are things that are going to be out of your control. Um, I have lost jobs for things that were outside of my control. I have left jobs for reasons that um, I had to, you know, it, it was going to be the last job I was going to ever going to have 18 months into it. I realized this is not right. The situation wasn't right. So don't don't feel like um, you know, th that you have to accomplish what it is that you're setting out necessarily to accomplish today because your career is going to evolve. It's going to evolve because of changes that you have, because of passions are going to change, your life is going to change, and things are going to change around you. Um, I, I think, you know, I'll just leave it with that. I think that you know, that's kind of two pieces of advice is don't be afraid of change and don't um, yeah, don't feel like you have to prove, you know, your career based on a decision that you're making today. Um, my advice, I have two things. One, my first thing was very similar to Rich's, which was definitely talk to your professors. If you're, if anything interests you in the class or just ask them about it ask after class, maybe stop by in office hours. Um, especially the civil engineer professors, they love to talk to you. And I'm sure every every professor at RPI would love to go more and like talk more about what they're teaching or even just the industry too. Um, and if there's something we didn't hit on, like transportation, talk to one of the transportation engineers and ask them your questions if that's what you think you wanna go into. My other advice is definitely pick and mold your career where you're always learning. To me, that's what keeps me happy and keeps me happy in my in the industry. I love civil and in the industry because I'm always learning. I don't think I'm ever going to know everything. I don't think anyone ever knows everything, even just in geotechnical. And then if you want to even go outside of that, there's so many other branches. So 
pick something you're interested in that you're always going to be learning in. Those are great words of advice from all of you. So thank you. Um, I, I wanted to open it up to student questions if you have any. Uh, any questions at this point? Uh, I haven't gotten any private questions, but if anyone is comfortable, you can certainly unmute your mic at this point. Um, and of course, turn your camera on because it's always nice to see faces, especially when we're all remote these days. Um, but yeah, we'll give you guys a couple seconds to think about um, what questions you might have. Now, um, continuing off of what Cassie mentioned um, about office hours, um, Previously, the past two years, office hours have all been virtual, and now we're starting to actually incorporate um, in-person experiences for those. So take advantage of those because um, it's definitely, if a, if a faculty member recognizes you from you coming into their office and, and having a conversation, that's only gonna work in your favor for, for any area of engineering, not just civil. But um, I know that if you do have additional questions, um, just, just for your reference, Rich and Ruben, I am not an engineer. Um, we have a first year advising hub that we uh, meet with students and then they move on to a faculty advisor from sophomore to senior year. So we get the ball rolling with all the academic requirements and then a faculty member in their major will mentor them until they graduate. So we kind of have a partnership here, but um, if anybody has questions and they would like to speak to a faculty advisor sooner than, you know, sophomore year, I can always coordinate something with that as well. So just wanted to throw that out there for anybody who was inquiring. And I would argue connecting with the civil department is never a bad idea because um, they are wonderful, the professors up there, and I would also like to share that our um, Professor Letchford and Professor Bennett are the reason why we have our wonderful um, panel tonight, because they recommended every single one of them. So, um, you know, it, it makes it really fun when you have a close-knit department, um, and if you think about it, you know, and civil is right for you, you know, a couple down the, or years down the road, you could be doing the same thing, you know. Um, Staying connected to RPI, meeting students who are coming in, sharing your words of wisdom. Um, okay, so it's 702, so we are precisely almost on time. So I guess I shouldn't use the word precisely, <laughs> um, but we are almost on time. Um, so I would love to thank our panelists so, so, so very much for spending your evening with us. We're very grateful. Um, and this will be recorded. I'll make sure you guys get the recording as well. Um, and then, um, you know, of course, keeping in mind that we know there's a ton of civil engineers who wanted to attend tonight that couldn't. Um, you might hear from them um, as they finish it up and they get your contact information. Um, but for everyone else, Karen, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you have any final words, um, but our students have a great evening. Have a great evening, everyone. It was great to have you here. Thank you for thank attending you. tonight. It was it was really enjoyable. So I appreciate you being here. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, thanks, thanks for Karen. Thank you, thank you.